okay can you can uh, i can see you're off <laughs> so thank you liz for joining today no um, problem the sound's all clear and you're perfect yep ready to yep. go okay That's i'll dive good. straight in thank you for your time today so just to start so we'll be talking about the olympics and winning a commonwealth you know games bronze medal but every running journey has a beginning where did yours start oh gosh so um my running journey began because my mum used to run um so she used to run for health and fitness um and i think i was quite an energetic child and my mum was always trying to exhaust me out by doing various different sports and um i think one day i said can i come for a run with you so she took me um, i think it was for a four mile run near where i lived in bedfordshire around flitwick and um i can remember thinking i got hot it was a very hot day and i remember getting halfway around it thinking oh, i'm really like hot mom. I, I, yeah <laughs> i just want to stop and i you know, it wasn't necessarily a pleasurable um, experience. I got home absolutely exhausted. Um, but more. Um, and then, so I always remember, you know, my mum take me out for a run. And it wasn't until I went to middle school, um, I think it's year five now, and we get, I went to middle school and we did cross country in the winter. And we all stood on the start line and, you know, I was really excited about it. And we all raced off around this kind of common next to the school. Oh, the signal just went. Was, sorry, sorry, you all, sorry. So you all raced round, then the signal, when you turned, it went. <laughs> okay, we all raced off um, on this common. We all went and everyone was sprinting. And then about 300 metres later, I looked behind me and no one was there. They'd all slowed up and I was like, oh okay I'll just keep going and I think I won it by over a minute and I think that was probably the first realization that I had kind of a natural talent for running um and that kind of the penny drop then and it was something that I I really loved. So did you have like an after school club that you could carry on this passion or was it a case of we're the same age and I, I remember when I was at school it was a case of you had to wait till the counties was on or there were school competitions there wasn't really that much unless in the summer of races was that the same at the school that you went to? Um, I think my mum um, had a friend whose daughter went to the local running club in Bedford and they offered to take me down there to see if I enjoy, would enjoy it. And so they took me one week and I loved it. And then they continued to take me um, until, for a quite a few number of years. Um, and I, you know, I absolutely adored it. And I met like-minded girls. Um, the social side was just as good as the running. And we entered competitions kind of in that guise. And yes, my school entered me into school competitions but I think my experience that winter of um my first ever cross country for the school I think it was like the county school championships or something we all went on a bus and I, I think it was a blizzard and we arrived at Bedford Park and I was in like little tiny running shorts and a little top with a duffel coat over the yes. top and I was freezing and then my teacher was trying to pin a number on me in the middle of this field and um, she sent me off into this blizzard and goes, there's the start over there. So I was running across the field and the gun went and I was like 100 metres from the start. And these kids just disappeared into a blizzard. And um, I just stood in the middle of this field crying. Oh, <laughs> so you I didn't start it? No, I missed the start. And, and then I just had to wait in a bush on, you know, trying to shield from the snow in my duffel coat, freezing. Um, so you went was... and didn't even run? <laughs> no. Oh no, so disheartened. Yeah. What happened then after that? <laughs> I, I think things could have only got better. So yeah, I go oh. the next time. And, um, Sorry, the sound much, went a bit, but it's okay. Okay. I had much better experiences the next time. And I went to, you know, other school competitions where I met my fellow club mates because they were all in different schools. Um, we ended up racing each other at those events and I don't think I won any for a while but I was always mixing it up with the top three or four so so then yeah, how did it the journey start then getting like to a professional level when you just thought hang on I've got a passion here 
I've done my GCSEs and whatever. <laughs> what, how did it get to the next level? So I think it was just a real gradual um, phase. So I do like the national champs and I think as an under, how old was I? We, as an under, we couldn't run the nationals as an under 11. So I must've been an under 13. I think I came fifth in the national championships. Um, and then um, we kept progressing. So I was always mixing it in the top few. And then when I was 14, there was a chance that the English schools, that if we finished in the top six, we'd get an international vest. Yeah. Um, so I went through the, you know, running the schools events. I qualified for Bedfordshire, where I lived at the time. And um, we ran the championships, the English schools championships, and I scraped in in sixth position and got my first, was awarded my first England vest, where we had a home international oh, at Barry God. Island against um, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. And that was my kind of very first experience of international running. But when and you got I, that top, what, did, what was that feeling when you got that England top and thought, oh, wow, I'm going to run for my country? Uh, what was that experience? Yeah, it, it was incredible. Like, it was just, I don't know, it was a real honour. And I remember being so excited, like, the journey, you know, just visiting a place with a team and being part of that and being able to share that journey. Yeah. Um, and meet other runners from, you know, who are just as good as you know I am, but in their own country, and just to experience that whole staying overnight and preparing for an event like that was a real steep learning curve and a really valuable one to take forward as well. And it gave me so much more confidence um, in my ability. I think the problem is when you're a child, you don't always realise that you're good at something, and you know it's it's nice to have those little moments that go actually. I'm all right at this, you know, so it forces or encourages you um, to maybe put a little bit more effort into the training and preparation or, um, you know, look at what other girls are doing and to who, be good. Who was your huge support? Obviously your mum, because she was a runner herself. She must be thinking, wow, you know, this, I just took her out one day and now all of a sudden got an England vest and there's something happening here. Well, my mum, I didn't live with my mum after the age of 11 because my parents divorced. Um, so my mum um, moved to Cornwall and I lived with my dad. Um, so we we're a single parent family and he worked six days a week. So That's when my parents, yeah, split up, I was practically brought myself up really. And my coach, Alex Stanton, um, used to come and pick me up and take me to the running club where I'd run a mile he'd drive out of his way to collect me and take me to the running club four days a week. So Monday to Thursday, he'd do that every single night. And then he would drop me home every night. And if he hadn't have done that, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to get to the running club because um, my dad was still at work. Yes. Um, and there's no way I would have made, you know, being an international athlete, let alone go to any Olympics. So, you know, my coach was more than just a running coach. He was um a had a significant impact on my childhood he was you know a real support in encouraging me not just as a runner but as a person as well so um so, do you obviously going through a divorce as a child mentally do you think running really helped you escape at that period running was that that helped save you in some ways get through and make you stronger or do you think you was naturally yeah. strong anyway um, no, I think it definitely hardened me to yeah. certain things. And I think I definitely used running um, to kind of numb some of the pain right. that I was feeling because I didn't, yeah, I was upset that my parents split up as you would be. Well, and, naturally, yes. And um, yeah, so I think I definitely used running in a positive way. And if I didn't have running, I think it could have been smoking with all the other girls. <laughs> um you know, or getting going down the wrong path. So I definitely think running kept me on the straight and narrow as a teenager. Paths open to you at that age, and thankfully I chose running um, because I had um, some really sound friends, and Alec was a very good um, 
kind of father figure and his wife Rosemary in my life. Um, you know, they they looked after us all, all the running girls, as if we were their own. So family. They were, you had a, yeah, another yeah. family. That was your family. Oh, that sounds brilliant. Yeah. So um, we was going back on track. So if, with the running journey, you got the England vest. What was the next after like all the national school? When did it start getting to the bigger stage? Sorry, you can tell which bit I'm oh, excited about. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, it was about choosing a career. And, you know, I think I was really keen to become an interior designer when I was 18. And my, my careers advisor put me off. And he was like, oh, what do you enjoy doing? I was like, well, I enjoy PE. I enjoy art. And he's like, why don't you become a teacher? And okay. so he was like, you get long holidays. And I was like, well, the hours would fit with training and... So I chose a career, went to university and um, chose a career in teaching. Part time and when I first qualified to juggle, my running was always the priority. So it's like, how can I do this running? And then I need to pay the bills. So yeah. um, I worked as minimally as I can. So I think I got part time <laughs> jobs like three days a week and the rest of the time I was training um, and I just... I was like, I just need enough to pay the rent and yeah. do what I love doing. And that's what I did. And I've met Martin when I was at university. So we were sharing that journey together. He was, my husband now, is um, he was training as well. And he actually ended up tra um, becoming a professional Ironman triathlete. Um, so we were both kind of going on this sporting journey together whilst trying to cobble together a buck here and there <laughs> so was you was you um, competitive from then on is that what drew you two together that you had this passion for this sport but also um, the competitive yeah is that what I think so I think I'm I mean I met him at university and I think he was like well I need to keep up or <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <do something."> <laughs> 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 can't beat him join him well exactly because so you didn't yeah. just have martin you had his sister as well in the family so that you know you had that mm. i suppose yeah martin's sister. worry of yeah. trying to um you had something to talk about that was for sure but you had that pa all had the same passion and you're all highly yeah. competitive that that must have did you feed off each other and I think so, yeah. I think it was much more motivating to get out the door training if you knew your partner was as well. And, um, he'd, you know, that's just the lifestyle we lived. We were, you know, go away training. And, you know, was, at the time it was fantastic because we didn't have any dependence and um, any responsibility. <laughs> we yeah. just went away and um, did what we wanted to do in order to become better athletes and pursue that um as much as we could and I think the biggest move came in 2001 when um we moved to Loughborough and my husband got a postdoctorate position there and I was like that's brilliant because that's where um the, Sebco and all the famous yeah yes and the um kind of institute of sport was there for um endurance as well so I was like fantastic so when I got there I got some lottery funding um, because I finished top 10 I think it's top 20 in the world championship so I managed to get on the funding um, train and I got access to loads of great facilities and massage and physio and I think that was when I was able to make a real difference in my running because I could pursue it full-time I gave up teaching um, I think I got eight thousand pounds a year from lottery which isn't a lot but not really it's I was gonna say <laughs> yeah but it was enough to cover my bills and then I had to be creative about you know, I was thinking in ways. your case cover your trainers the amount that you'll go through <laughs> with all the running <laughs> uh, I was uh, yeah yeah I mean I was very fortunate because I had a sponsor in Adidas who um gave me my shoes and my clothing and Martin and I were thinking well you know this isn't enough to live on so we have to be more creative so I started writing for Runners World magazine and I think I was writing a column called The Road to Athens and I hadn't any idea whether I'd qualify for the Athens Olympics at the time. But I was writing about, you know, my journey and what that would look like. And so and that opened doors because I'm writing in, you know, magazines. So then I got other endorsements. So, um, yeah, I was trying to be a bit canny around what can I do to make a living in the sport 
um, whilst allowing me to be a full-time athlete as well. And um, I have Martin to thank for that because I wasn't very good at selling myself, um, but he was much better at doing that for me. Um, you always creative. find that everyone's like that, no good at selling themselves. So, yeah, no, it's <laughs> so what? So when, what you're saying with the Athens, that was your first Olympics. When did it mm. start kicking in? This was a reality. I could be an Olympian. What? Well, I think I had you, done the you would have watched the same Olymp Olympics as me. So then suddenly yeah. to think, hang on, I've got a chance of being one myself. What? Yeah, was I that think, moment? Um, it was in 2003. And um, I'd kind of got in this cycle of the track season and the um, cross country season. And the track wasn't doing it for me. I did the 10,000 at the Commonwealth Games in 2002. I finished fourth, but it was just hurt. 10,000 meters just really hurt. And I got so nervous about the event and I just didn't enjoy it at all. And then I've got an injury doing cross country in the winter of 2003. And on that same day, my nan died as well. And I'd won this cross country event, but pulled my Achilles and had to take, I think, you know, four weeks off. And it made me reassess everything. Um, and I was like, well, my cross country season's gone. The beginning of the track season's gone. So what am I going to focus on? And I was like, now is the time to do a marathon. Um, okay. It's the Olympic year next year. And um, it forced me to change my pattern of behavior because I just got stuck in this kind of cycle of track cross country, track cross country. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to do a marathon. So I set my sights on doing Berlin in... Um, September 2003 and I looked at the qualifying times and I was absolutely certain that it was within reach and I was like well this is going this is a possibility um and oh, wow. I don't know why I had there's been a few times in my life I've have I've had this feeling of absolute certainty and one was in, in English schools where I was the underdog I think I finished second the two previous years to Gina Mitchell and um we you remember the name <laughs> yeah and we were on the start line and everyone thought Gina would win it again and we were back and forth through the whole race and I managed to overtake her with 50 meters to go and that was it that race I knew I was gonna I knew I was gonna win it and it was weird because I was like how do I know you know how can you say you know that but this was another time I stood on the start line of Berlin and I just thought this is mine the qualifying time for Athens is mine and I had absolutely no doubt I'd get it and I did I ran 2.30.58 which was the qualifying time was 2.34 at the time um bagged my Olympic qualifying time and then it was kind of a waiting game to see if any how many other people would run faster than me and thankfully only one other which was Paula Radcliffe of course um was able to run faster so yeah, it was, yeah, it was, um, so 2003 was a real realisation that actually this is something that I'm very capable of doing. So um, knowing then, like when it was confirmed you was going to be in the Olympics, like what was going through your head? Like mm. I, I can only picture like, because I only managed on the 2012 to get a ticket for the Paralympics. I couldn't even get a ticket for the main Olympics and just being in the crowd, the atmosphere for you being at a start line, being part of it, you know, training up for it. Oh, please share the excitement. You know, what was you feeling? The mm. buzz? Have you had that high oh. since? You know, because you've done two Olympics. Um, no, nothing. So. Yeah. The only thing I can um, account like match up to since is um, I've become an interior designer since, and it's kind of the final oh. day where you're pulling everything together before the client gets back to see it the big reveal, and that's the only thing I can kind of attribute it to. But no, it's it's very buzzy, very exciting. Um, you're so motivated to train, and I think the pressure is off because you've qualified. And actually, you can really enjoy and wallow in the journey. So for me, I was, you know, and receiving all the kit that you get, it was just like Christmas. Like you go and choose all your kit and <laughs> oh, hang on, it's just the sounds going a bit. Yeah, I think we got going. You, uh, said, so Christmas, she was getting all the kit, 
and then is the internet going? Okay, and you get all the, you know, all the sponsors of the Olympics like Panasonic with oh, your first... Virgin Media is really bad. Can oh, hang on a minute. Know? Hang on. Can you see you're going a bit? I don't know if it's me. Can you talk a bit? There. Hello? Bella, I can, can you hear me now. Yeah, your picture's a bit out of sync with you yeah, talking. So it was so like Christmas. That's the bit I got up to. Yeah, it was like Christmas, and you'd get loads of gifts from the sponsors of um, the British team. So, like Panasonic would give you like a video camera, and um, we got all these different freebies, and it it just felt really amazing, and you felt really special. Um, and we'd go to loads of photo shoots and for the team GB and um, yeah, it was incredible. But it, you know, the whole experience of going to the um, the training camp in Cyprus with the team and preparing in hot weather and the staff were there to really serve you and make sure you had everything you needed. And I've never experienced anything like that before. Um, and also to share the journey with um, so many amazing athletes. I think I had the pleasure of sharing an apartment with Kelly Holmes in the holding camp. And, you know, she was someone I really looked up to. And it was a real magical experience to be able to see how she prepared. And, um, you know, she won the double gold there as well. So yes. Was, yeah. And you was, was in the incredible. same room. You were sharing the same room with her. Oh, yeah, wow. That must yeah, have been a party that night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah, it was incredible. And I think the whole Olympic experience, you're there as, you know, the best in what you do in your country, along with everyone else from around the world who's the best at what they do. So it's a real surreal bubble and everyone's buzzing and looking forward to their event. And Athens did an incredible job. The whole city was alive. Um, there was such an amazing feeling. And to be able to run on the original route um, um, from Marathon to um, Athens was incredible as well, where the marathon originated from, and to finish in. I was going to say it's called planet. Marathon, isn't it? The place where you yeah. started was called Marathon. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, it was. I mean, it was scorchy. It was my second ever marathon. I think the start line it was forty degrees at six pm in the evening. So, um, yeah, it was hot. <laughs> but being <laughs> Athens, being honest, it's quite a polluted city and you, you know, doing the marathon, running around the city, even at six o'clock at night, did you feel it? Did it, do you feel that affected your performance? Not so much the heat, but the pollution because, you know. Yeah, I think, I didn't really notice the pollution, I think, because um, the Olympics were in town, a lot of the traffic had been reduced and particularly when we were running, all the roads were closed. So um, I didn't, notice the pollution as such I think we were so concerned about the heat that was the main thing that would hinder us um, it wasn't anything that we really considered at the time and I don't I didn't really notice it either I think because we were in marathon it's not as polluted so it's only okay. the final stretch when you get into Athens that it was um, would have been a concern but I think um, it was yeah late in the evening by the time we came in half past eight not that late but <laughs> <laughs> well for you so what then you went you you done Athens and, and did you think okay I'm gonna go for I'm young enough fit enough I can go for Beijing what was it like as soon as you finished Athens was you still in that buzz and yeah I I mean I had a solid race I didn't run it I you know anything I, I said I went to Athens and I experienced it and I learned a lot and I came away wanting more and um, so I think I finished 25th I was first Brit home um, but I didn't feel I had I felt like I could give more so I set my sights on, sights on the 2006 Commonwealth Games because I'd watched Kelly Holmes get the double gold and stand on the podium and I was like wow I really want a piece of that it's just <laughs> so incredible um, and so I set my sights on um, wanting to win a medal at the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne, Australia, two years later. And that's what I focused on. Um, but 2005, I went a bit crazy after Athens. I thought I'm going to train harder than I've ever trained before. Um, and I basically overtrained and had to have three months on the sidelines in 2005 from overtraining and chronic fatigue. Okay. So 
2005 wasn't a great year um, because when you're tired, you can't even cross train. So I'm mean, I could barely, you know, move up my whole body eight um, day to day from doing no exercise. So yeah, it was three months until I got over that, and then I had to kind of gradually phase my training. So I think I started back training in the August, the follow, the summer before the Commonwealth Games, which were in March the following year. Um, and I had to send a begging letter to the selection committee, um, asking them to select me. <laughs> oh, is that, that how I it couldn't... works? Is that? Yeah. Well, That's not a... normally. Normally, no, normally yeah. you do a tr- normally you do a trial event. But I was not well enough to run the trial, so they based it on my previous experiences and um, selected me based on that. Thankfully, and then I promised them I'd bring them back a medal. Which you did. And what's yeah. it like standing on that podium and seeing the flag go up was, oh, you must have had tears. Yeah. Yeah, I was ecstatic. And to do it in Melbourne was amazing because they did, they did the game so well. And to finish the MCG with 80,000 people shouting at you oh, is wow. just incredible. I've never experienced anything like it. The ground was shaking, you know. I think I saw Martin at the end and I tried to speak to him. I was like, I just can't hear you. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. So, yeah, it was, it, it was very magical. And, you know, you work so hard all those years and I won lots of team medals, but it was really um, lovely to win a, an individual medal. Um, so I kind of attribute that to kind of my effort throughout my entire running career it goes into that medal. And then um, Beijing happens. Yeah, you, know, I you, you weren't them. happy with one. You actually did get another into another Olympics and marathon as well. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. was I mean, I was. Yeah, and I was so determined to make those Olympics. So I'd learned so much in the previous years, and I knew I had more to give. So I was really excited about preparing, and I was much more. I wasn't as naive or as ignorant about you know going to Athens. I was just like a star, <laughs> star <laughs> it, go, oh. as long as she wasn't um, a diva that's all right <laughs> no yeah no way um so yeah I was like I'm gonna go to Beijing and I want to do something um and you know I had I qualified for Beijing by the skin of my teeth there were quite a few competitive Brits going into the Beijing qualification and I had to run the trials at London the all the spring before it and um, I knew I'd have to run a PB to qualify. Um, and I remember at 19 miles, I looked, there's this roundabout where you come, you come off the third exit. And I remember looking across the roundabout and seeing Hayley Haining from Scotland um, just behind me. And I was like, right. <laughs> and I think I, ha- I had to have a word with myself. And I said, well, if she's going to beat me, she's going to have to work for it. And I just put the hammer down and I did not look back until I got to the finish. So seven miles of just gritting my teeth and um holding on and thankfully I I mean I only I was only 45 seconds in front of her which is nothing really over the marathon distance but I managed to secure first Brit and get my place for Beijing because Paula had already been pre-selected. But do you think it was very fair that you entered the Bath and Reading half marathons you know before Beijing considering you was on a roll and training and your you know, after suffering with the tiredness and then building up your strength to suddenly, you, your name's still down as, you know, one, o- one hour, nine yeah. minutes for a half marathon. You yeah, know, yeah. Most people that do a 10K will try and get under that, you know, and you do a, a half marathon in like one hour, nine. That must have been a good year. I know, well. Or two years. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, 2007, 2008 were, and 2006 were great years for me in terms of my running career. And I'd learned a lot from 2005 where I'd overtrained and I'd spoken to a physiologist about my training regime and I was doing too much of it too hard. And so I learned to train and have hard days, easy days. I learned the importance of recovery and rest in a training program. Um, And I also learned the importance of doing what works for me, not trying to emulate what other people are doing. So, um, you know, doing a training program that really works for me. And I talked to lots of different coaches. So 2005 was the basis. So sometimes as an athlete, you get really down when you get injured or ill. And actually, 
it can be a really positive experience if you use that to work out why is that happening to me and actually by doing that it gave me the best years in my running career and so as a result of that you know the bronze at Commonwealth Games I was able to run my fastest marathon time in 2008 qualifying for the Olympics I think around 228 and then obviously a lot of my preparation I used to race half marathons going into a marathon so yeah I hold the record at Bath in yeah 69 minutes but you know I was running averaging 550 miling for that half marathon and I you know I can't even imagine doing that now <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say you, you if we'll talk about London being your last one and then I want to find out mm. uh, I'm cautious of the time that um you know London marathon 2012 I'm, I'm a big I love mm. watching London marathon on telly um and I remember watching it and you coming through and like the finishing, like I've never done the London. I've never been lucky enough. Um, I do do marathons, but I've never been able to get into um, London. And I do, I always watch the athletes, you know, coming down to the finish. What was, what was that like for you? Because that was your last, wasn't it? Your last professional yeah. marathon. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was my last race because I, you know, I'd, after I finished Beijing, I um, had a daughter, Ruby, in 2009. Um, and then because London, the Olympics were in London, I was like, I cannot not try for it. Um, so I continued to train after having had my daughter. And I did actually get myself in really good shape. But I neglected my core stability quite a lot and oh. managed to put my back out in... Um, 2009 the back end of 2009 in Bristol half marathon and um it's caused me that I'm still suffering from nerve damage down my leg which means um I have a numb leg and I struggle to lift it up so I had all the loads of treatment on it um trying to prepare for the trials at the London Marathon 2012 um and I had several attempts at running marathons and it just wasn't happening I'd and I knew, I stood on the start line of the trial race at London in 2012. And I said, well, if I'm having a good day, I, you know, I'm fit enough, I might qualify. Um, but if I'm having a bad day, this is my last marathon. So I knew it was very clear in my head. And I knew that if I was, wasn't going to qualify for the Olympics, I would retire on that day. And if I qualified for the Olympics, then I would retire after the Olympics. And so it was kind of very black and white what would happen. And then at mile six at London, my legs started playing up and my pace yeah. dropped. And I just knew, yeah, like I was just like, but you know what? This is it. Enjoy it. Run around. Enjoy the marathon. Don't, you know, because I could have run And you had the support. Around. You had the support, you know, and yeah. screaming at you at the TV. And, you know, it's actually because... Yeah, I didn't think everyone would understand what I was doing, but it was like everyone just got it and everyone was very supportive and everyone was clapping and cheering me. And it was a, actually a really incredible way to say goodbye to the sport. Um, and I'm really thankful to everyone for that. And I couldn't have made a better exit if I had planned it, really. And I think um, the BBC had a you know made a tribute to me running down the mall and said this is it for Liz you know and it was lovely I mean I did have a lump in my throat running the whole way down the mall um yeah. because I knew it was my last marathon and even talk you know thinking back to it, it makes me quite emotional but it was it was a very magical day and a nice way to say goodbye to the sport and you know my dad always said to me you know you don't choose when you leave the sport you're you're your body <laughs> yes for you <laughs> and um I you know my I have very been very fortunate to have trained very hard and had a very long career so I didn't retire until I was 34 or 36 even but um you know I want to run for the rest of my life and so to keep training at such a high intensity um just wouldn't be good for my body um and I'm fortunate I can still run albeit with two numb legs but um there's nothing sinister going on there it's just um years oh, of running what's your distance now so obviously um, you're not doing marathons because you can't you, no what's your limit now a park run 
<laughs> well, I don't really race anymore. I used to do a few trail races, and um, but I, I do six miles most days um, just to tick over and keep fit. And occasionally I'll go and do a hill session because I want a big blowout. Um, but really I'm running for fitness. And I want to do stuff later on in my life. So I want to go on adventures. So I want to put, put a backpack on and I want to go and explore the mountain with my mark with martin and i want to bivy out um in the shepherd huts and i just want to go and explore so i want to be able to use my body to explore the world once my children have grown up um so that's kind of how i want to use my running in the future but i don't see the point in racing like on the road anymore because i'm just going to be much slower and it hurts so <laughs> much more than it used to but is um, it but is it do you you obviously you and martin both you've got your own um yelling foundation and you do give back and um i'm very much about diversity myself i'm part of northampton park run and i try and in, encourage diversity you know wheelchairs visually impaired yeah. deaf and I, I was interested reading about you with richard's um the amp double amputee and he yeah so is that something when you gave up you thought you and Martin decided, okay, let's help others and use our experience. Um, well, um, we both love coaching and helping others. And I was very fortunate in 2004 to meet Richard Whitehead, um, who you probably recognise now as the um, double, um, the Paralympian who won the 200 metres T42 category. So he's a double leg amputee. And so I've worked with Richard for a number of years and we're still good friends now. Um, so, you know, I was very lucky to kind of our paths were crossed and we were able to work together and I really enjoy coaching other athletes now and you know teaching them to learn about what works best for them and how they can best structure their training to get the most from their own running and I, I adore that um, and one day I might end up down the local um, athletics club doing some coaching when my children have grown up but I know what a huge commitment that is and I'm not ready for that quite yet um, and then my husband Martin is trying to set up um, a charity called Stormbreak, which is a children's mental health charity um, at the moment. So we're trying to um, focus on things that aren't about us anymore and are more about um, other people and trying to do some good in the world in some kind of guise. So, yeah, if we can help people in that That's way, that would be great. That'd be great, um, but we have a yeah a coaching business, I guess, um, to help. You know, it's a business; it's not a charity. Um, but Storm no, Boat but it's still nice that you're using that experience to to help others, and you know, yeah. to share it. You know, not many people share. Yeah, and, and it's I good think... to see someone that isn't an, an, an yeah. was an elite to still carry on in the field and give to others because. Yeah. When you started, you know, your marathons and that, like, what do you think now when you see, like, the London Marathon, 40,000 runners and over 20,000 of charity runners, the runners like me that do over five hours, what's, what, how do you feel seeing that, you know, the fun runners, so to speak, not the elite runners? I love it. <laughs> yeah, I love the fun runners. Actually, I ran um, a few years ago at London Marathon. I ran with the um the fun runners and i started in with the rhinos um so yeah. they were right at the back of one of the starts and it was a really different experience and um it was quite magical you know to see all the kind of the staggered starts and the fact that actually i could have gone to the toilet once the gun had started because still had 25 <laughs> minutes stood on the start line and i was yeah still trying to still trying to prepare like an elite athlete and go to the loo before the gun had gone off and everything yeah um so i you know i think running is an amazing sport and i think it can give so much to anyone that does it so i think you know for me now it's great for my mental health and um it's great for making me feel better about myself and um, i think it helps me to be a more patient mother um, and wife and i just think it gives so much to my life and that i want others to enjoy that as well and you don't necessarily have to chase times i mean lots of people are very motivated by running as fast as they can and that's absolutely fantastic but some people just want to be able to enjoy running for getting out in the great outdoors and exploring um, yeah. other people just want to be able to be fit enough to 
chase their own children around or their own grandchildren around and I think you know you can tap into running and make it as challenging as you want to so I think it's such an accessible sport you don't you know we need really is a decent pair of trainers and you know you can you can run and I, that's what I've loved about running is you can go anywhere around the world with your shoes and you can put them on even if it's down Beijing High Street you know you can still get out <laughs> for a run so um and it's been done <laughs> so yeah it's um not many can say that but yes yeah. rub it in Liz rub yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I mean I'm I love running I love sport I think it's a fantastic thing for um, everyone to get involved with and I think finding something that you enjoy doing is, is um, can only add to your life so what's your advice to anyone listening that thinks hang on you know I could be in with a chance here to get you know to get them thinking to the next level go for it um I think it's it depends you know if you just want to get involved in running I mean just you know the couch to cut 5k is a fantastic getting you out there and easing you into it carefully um I think if you want to change your running up and you know challenge yourself a bit more it might be that you go to a local running club and join a coach or a group of runners and um, if you're already in a group of runners and you want more it might be that you then reach out to a more personalized coach um with more guidance training so there's various levels um, at which you can kind of challenge yourself with that but um, there's so much out there as well now so yeah I think you need to think what you want from your running and then go get it oh thank you Liz for sharing your running tales that's been brilliant um can I can I just take a photo of us two so I can share it yeah. on my social media is that all right yeah thank you I'll go Hey. and is it okay <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm easily pleased me um i um i also i've got my own little voluntary running group and um i do have deaf runners and some of them lip read is it okay if i can share this video with them so yeah they can absolutely they can't listen so yeah um no i'm i'm very much um um into elite runners so like to, for you to say you was chat today, I'm more excited for me, not for the listeners, because <laughs> I'm like, we're the same age and like I watched the Olympics and everything and just, I was fascinated, but oh. never saw myself as a runner, never. And then seven years ago, decided to run and just naturally fell into marathons. What made you run? Um, I live in Northampton, so yeah. not far from where you was born, Well and Garden City. Ah. Up and yeah. um yeah i yeah i my first marathon was seville and, oh nice um because i couldn't get into london and that was mm -hmm. 2015 and that was hot and yeah. just getting round i felt like wow but running from the country even though little old me i was like yeah I did it you know because <laughs> seville was a not a big marathon like it is now and then the following yeah. year it was Paris, but I didn't have a good one in Paris. And to be honest, it's not yeah. my favorite marathon. And then um, yeah. I've done Barcelona. So every time I don't get into London, I, I go up in Europe and say, right, who will have me? <laughs> and then, and I've started. I've seen the world, isn't it? It mm. is. Last year I was in Seattle and it was just doing the marathon there. Oh. It was so hilly. But have you ever done Beachy Head Marathon? Yeah. Have you ever done beachy head? No, no, I, no, I've had, no, I've coached people to it, but I've never done it. So, yeah. No, it was, yeah, it was hard. But like, it was interesting you were saying about 2005, your injury, and I could personally do with some advice from you myself at the moment. I've done my peripheral syndrome. So I get the shooting pain mm. that goes down my leg as well as the TFL muscle. And during this lockdown, I've not been running for nearly coming up to 11 weeks now. So mentally, it's really, really affecting. What tips can you give me? I'm, I've got, lucky enough, I'm seeing a physio. So um, okay. I'm getting my stretches in that in, but it's just so long-winded. How? Are they, 
are they advising that you do some core work or anything? No, they just advised me um, to do, um, you know, like the donkey kick, um, the where you, your leg, you, you've got the rubber band around yeah. your ankles and you go out. And then, the plan. Um, yeah, the, and it's just, uh, maybe I'm impatient, but I'm just like, I want to at least be walking, f- you know, a good few miles by now. So, yeah. Yeah, it, I think a lot of those issues stem from core work and I think core is a real foundation from a lot of people's running. So, you know, strengthening up your lower back and your core and getting lots of stretch into your glutes. So all of that area, if you strengthen it, it might help support your skeletal system and take some pressure off of some of those nerve pains that you're getting through your glutes. And yes, I feel like an athlete now. I feel like an athlete. <laughs> I was meant to be yeah. doing New York this year and they cancelled yesterday. So I think I'm the only marathon runner that's like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I can that. recover oh. from, yeah, I can recover from my leg and then take it on. So Brilliant. No, Liz, thank you for your time. You've given me more than You're enough. Welcome. Thank you very much. Bye. And well, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Take care. See ya.